Pokemon Legends Arceus has done something that I never thought would spawn from Game Freak, and that, my friends, is change. Game Freak has resisted change to their formula since the very beginning, and why should they bother? No matter the quality, each mainline Pokemon game sells ridiculously well. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as the saying goes. But the amount of tropes and gameplay mechanics left behind from the Game Boy games have not transitioned well over the years. Long-winded battles, the same plot structure, beat the gym leaders and fight the Elite Four. These are just a few elements of Pokemon that haven't been developed further since the 90s. So we're just gonna jump the heck into this, because I can't help but gush about how damn good the gameplay loop has evolved to. Also, this is a spoiler-heavy video, so if you want to avoid that, then click on the card up above. I added a pretty Liebig video for you to watch. Anyway, I'll go ahead and start with the negatives in quotations. So stating the obvious, yes, visually, the game can look pretty awful. This is mostly when you're out in the fields and mountains. There's a lot of pop-in that happens, objects in the background transition from 3 to 60 frames a second depending on its distance, and the graphical fidelity drops to pixels at some points. With that said, some parts of the game actually look pretty good. Jubilife Village and the inside of the buildings look nice, and the characters are well detailed and more expressive than usual. Personally, I'm not much of a stickler for graphics. There were really only a couple points where I was baffled at the drop in quality. I'm mostly pointing towards Cobalt Coastlands. Your Pokeball is ridiculously pixelated when catching Pokemon in the water. I also have to point out that, similar to Sword and Shield, Game Freak goes out of its way to provide as little animation to the cutscenes as possible. If something cool or interesting is about to happen in the story, the screen fades to white or black. In the grand scheme of things, you're probably not gonna care about this kind of stuff because the story usually doesn't enhance Pokemon games. But is it a bit annoying to see a lack of polish? Yeah, definitely. But let's not forget that this is running on the Switch, a piece of hardware that's very outdated and is several years old at this point. Some people are also complaining about the lack of Pokemon, with a total of 240 if you don't count Darkrai and Shaman that you get by having save data of Let's Go and Sword Slash Shield. As someone that's completed the Pokedex, 240 is more than enough. It took me over 70 hours to catch them all, and that was with a handful of Pokemon traded. And finally, some people think 180 moves isn't enough, and while I agree that you'll see repeat moves once you get into the post game, it doesn't detract from the gameplay at all. Speaking of the gameplay, holy sh**. Did they nail it out of the park? I honestly don't even know where to start. I guess let's just watch the tutorial. This entire game is kind of like several wild areas in Sword and Shield, only this time they're much more lively, larger, and more enjoyable to roam around in. If you see a Pokemon, you sneak up from behind or near it, throw a Pokeball, and it catches. Gone are the days of random Pokemon encounters. Gone is the intermission screen from overworld to battling. It is streamlined to you literally throwing the ball, hopefully catching the Pokemon, and moving Moving forward. I can't fathom how amazing it feels every time you catch a pocket monster. You get this insane serotonin boost due to how smooth and fluid it is. When running around, you'll also find a lot of patches of grass. These are used to hide yourself to try to catch a Pokemon without it noticing you. The element of stealth is strangely peaceful, it's kind of hard to describe. And that little jingle you get every time you catch a Pokemon is so satisfying. If you want to swap out different types of Pokeballs or items, you don't have to pause the game anymore. You just scroll through this menu on the bottom right screen. You can still pull up your item menu, of course, but all your vital items are available to you while playing. You've probably noticed a bunch of berries as well. These can be used to heal your Pokemon in certain ways, like usual, but they're also used as bait. It's taking an element from the Safari Zone and putting it to much better use. But of course, what if you want to fight the Pokemon? Probably something you want to do, right? Well, that's seamless as well. Just push X to switch from your items to your mod and you can flip through your team on the fly without having to manually organize them on a pause screen. You'll battle by throwing your Pokeball at or near the wild Pokemon, which again is a very natural progression for how these games should be played. Heck, you can even have motion controls on when aiming your throw, but that's off by default if that's not your cup of tea. I personally love the gyro aiming as someone that's a huge fan of the Splatoon series. Aiming down my sights with the gyro felt very intuitive. The battles themselves are still turn-based like usual, but there's a lot of cool things that really enhance them. For one, the UI looks sexy as hell. It's got this clean yet ancient look to it that doesn't hog up a lot of space on the screen. You can also physically run around and look at the battle at any angle you desire. Hell, you can run away from a battle by literally running away. The only time this doesn't work is with trainers. And yes, if you stand in front of a Pokemon when it attacks, you actually take damage, but more on that later. Now, you've probably
probably noticed the animations are much, much better than we've ever seen them. They're now at a vibrant eye candy status. And funny enough, you actually can't turn them off in this game, but it hardly matters considering how enjoyable the attacks are to watch. Back to the UI though, when you push Y, you can pull up the upcoming turn order, which to me is huge. You no longer have to guess who outspeeds who. It's such a small but appreciated quality of life feature. And then there's the actual moves. You're probably aware that they could be altered in a strong and agile style. Strong style just means the move is stronger, but you lose one of your turns to attack in the future. Agile is the complete opposite, in which the move is weaker, but you'll get an extra turn to attack. This adds an actual layer of strategy to the battles without altering what makes them fun in the first place. Some people may not like that you can see the turn order now, but you're not forced to look at it. And frankly, I think it makes planning out moves all the better. And believe it or not, there's still more new gameplay that frankly ties together this entire game. Remember in Pokemon Red and Blue how Oak said it was unsafe to go out in tall grass without protection? You probably never thought twice about that because you always had a Pokemon with you on each adventure. Even when they showed up in the overworld for the first time in Let's Go, they aren't really doing anything besides walking around minding their own business. Yeah, this game don't f around. Some of the weaker or baby Pokemon will just stare at you, some of them are taking a nap, but a lot of them see you as a threat and will actually attack. This isn't a new concept in video games, but this is a massive deal for Pokemon. Some attacks even cause side effects. You can get poisoned, dizzy, or even sleepy like your actual Pokemon. So not only can your Pokemon black out, but so can you, the trainer. And if you black out, you lose some of the rare items in your satchel and can't get them back. It's a genuine worry and forces you to be more reactive on the field. A lot of times, you'll have to roll out of the way as some of the attacks are fast or lock onto you. And you know what's really genius about this? You cannot catch a Pokemon if it's chasing or attacking you. You either have to be engaged in a battle already or sneak up when they aren't paying attention. It's a lot faster to just catch a Pokemon without going into battle. So playing stealthily is not only fun, but incentivized as well. And if you think the later game Pokemon are threatening, I haven't even brought up the alphas yet. These are bigger Pokemon that are high leveled and future red glowing eyes. They're much more powerful and can even be found very early in the game. I imagine a lot of you are going to run into this level 40 Rabidash and get out absolutely destroyed since he'll still be at a lower level. This is such a stark difference compared to even Sword and Shield, where you couldn't catch high-level Pokemon without having more gym badges. That's another huge difference. There isn't a single gym badge or gym leader to be found. There's a handful of obligated trainer battles, but you're mostly just fighting the ones out in the wild. Instead, you take on frenzied noble Pokemon. These are Pokemon that were well-respected to keep certain territories safe, but ended up becoming very violent and uncontrollable. This is when the game starts to feel a little bit like like Monster Hunter and Dark Souls. You have to run around and throw bombs to calm the noble Pokemon down while avoiding its attacks. At a certain point, you'll be able to use one of your Pokemon to fight it, but all that does is stun the noble one briefly so you can throw more bombs. So it basically takes the place of gym leaders, or I guess it's more in line with actual bosses. You also get to fight Palkia, Dialga, and Arceus in the same way, and I really don't want to play a Pokemon game again that doesn't do this. It's so refreshing. It really adds a lot of flair and excitement to the legendaries you're taking on. As you play through, you'll also have to collect materials to build your items. This is yet another layer that makes the gameplay really engrossing. Throughout the game, you'll find a ton of different items ranging from berries, to flowers, to apricorns, minerals, you name it. These are used to craft Pokeballs and potions yourself. You can still technically go to the shop and buy some items, but you're actually driven to craft everything on your own because it doesn't cost money, and you even get experience points for it. If you throw a Pokemon at a breakable crystal as an example, you get some items from that, and your Pokemon's experience level levels up a tiny bit. I should also mention that every Pokemon levels up at the same time in battles, and I don't think it could be turned off. But honestly, that would just dampen the pace of the whole game. It actually makes sense for everybody to gain experience simultaneously. You may have also noticed that there's no TMs or HMs to collect, and that's because that entire system has been rehauled in a much better fashion. Instead of running around and randomly fighting them on the ground, they can be purchased per Pokemon. Once you buy a new move, you can interchange that move anytime you want, or when you get to a certain level. So yes, if you really wanted to, you could swap out your new moves with all your old moves and vice versa. It's like building a deck of cards and using the right things at the right time. You can also change your Pokemon's name whenever you feel like it, and even when to evolve. 
Granted, you could technically avoid evolving Pokemon in the older games, but that option is much more simplified now. And then there's the riding Pokemon. They're another piece of the puzzle that makes the game move at a buttery smooth pace. At first, you're not going to have access to all of them, which is actually a good thing. It gives you a chance to get used to the overall movement and really feel the game out. And when things start to feel slow, you're given Ride Ear, which allows you to run fast and jump. I had a lot of fun using Ride Ear to climb up mountains in ways you weren't supposed to do. I'd find chunks in the mountains that I could land on and just mash the jump button to climb up. This is one of those games that has what I call fun jank. That's not the only jank I found. If you want to fall down a mountain without taking damage, literally just scrape your character across the mountain and you won't get hurt. The next red Pokemon you get is Ursaluna, which is probably the most worthless one ever. You can climb up hills a little bit easier, but otherwise you'll never use this one outside of digging for a peat block to get an Ursaluna. Following that is Vaskilgian. You can ride across the water and even perform jumps and dash forward. What I adore is that in the air, you can aim down your sights and try to catch Pokemon. The game goes into slow motion so you can actually control what you're doing. I didn't find this feature that useful, it's more just a cool thing. Then you've got Sneasler. You'll be able to climb up steep walls with ease, which really opens the scope of the game more. And finally, you get Bravery. Shoot up into the air and lightly glide across the world. What makes all these ride Pokemon so great is you can scroll through each one and activate them with the push of a button. No longer do you walk up to a body of water. Push A, click through a menu asking if you want to surf. No longer do you pull up your menu to fly. Swap Hopping through these Pokemon, especially in the post game, is incredibly satisfying due to how quick and easy it is. It feels like you have an immense amount of control at your fingertips. It's so much more refined compared to the older games. And this is just the base game I've talked about. The post game requires you to actually catch every Pokemon in order to get to Arceus. That may sound like a daunting task, but it's a lot more enjoyable than you'd think. First off, the way you evolve some Pokemon is more complex than just leveling them up. Like usual, you can use stones to get all the evolutions, but then sometimes you have to max out a Pokemon's friendship, or you have to find rare items in the Space Time Rift. Oh yeah, I haven't brought that up either. Space Time Rifts are massive spears of energy that randomly spawn when you're playing. When you go inside a rift, a bunch of rare items and Pokemon appear. You'll get the chance to get things like Porygon, Cranidos, the other starter Pokemon, and things like that. The Pokemon in the rift generally come together in groups of three and are all high level. This means you need to be well prepared for all the Pokemon will gang up on you and ruin everything. There's a lot of tension to not make mistakes when you spot a Pokemon you need for your decks. That's another small thing I didn't mention earlier, but if you start a battle near a couple of Pokemon, you have to fight both of them at the same time. This is when the game's difficulty starts to kick up a bit, especially if you throw out a Pokemon with a poor type matchup. On top of that, you'll occasionally see mass outbreaks, which take four Pokemon and group them all together. Sometimes you'll fight them all at once, and sometimes it's one by one. I didn't find the outbreaks that interesting, but it's still another way to freshen up the gameplay loop. As for other things to do in the game, there's dozens upon dozens of side quests to complete. These can range from people wanting you to fill a dex entry, or just catching a specific Pokemon. The hardest side quest that you have to complete involves finding 107 Wisps. They're these little purple flames hidden around the whole game. So imagine the Korok Seeds from Breath of the Wild, except there's less of them and you get a good award for completing this, which is Spiritomb. Every unknown letter is hidden around the world too as an extra collectible. And of course, there's still Shiny Hunting, which has actually gotten easier if that's the sort of thing you're into. The more Pokemon you catch, the more data the Pokedex collects, which in turn lets you unlock stars. You'll get these stars from one of the main characters, Silene. This is how you get the recipes to make better Pokeballs and better potions. And also like the other games, you're still able to customize your hairstyle and your clothes and all that fun jazz. So yeah, I don't know how else I can stretch my point across. The sheer amount of quality of life features makes Pokemon Legends Arceus one of the best and most important Pokemon titles of all time. It's sending a message to us that Game Freak is willing to evolve their franchise, and even if it visually looks awful or doesn't have that many Pokemon, that doesn't matter when the core gameplay actually makes Pokemon addicting again like it used to be decades ago. Thanks for watching everyone, until next time.